From a caveman cracking bones and cracking jokes round a fire, to the masked actors of ancient Greece, to the strolling minstrels and the spinners of tall tales, to the cast of Hamilton, theater in its many forms tells us the truth about ourselves. Theater is a mirror by which we can see ourselves slowed down, set apart, and lit up. But the last time that theater was everywhere was the last century. And as we cross the timeline of the 21st century, more theaters were closing than opening. In 2018, decade-old theaters such as the Lowry and the Quest have all made their final curtain call. But the need for live interaction in a theater space in this fast-paced, 24-7 video, video streaming world is more important than it ever has been before. <laughs> I remember the first time I stood alone on stage in front of an audience. It was the Christmas pageant, <laughs> fourth grade, Mary Beck Elementary, Elkhart, Indiana. I was nine. I was known as the sad-faced little girl because my teacher nicknamed me Sad Sack. <laughs> I was the little girl who never smiled. Of course, there were reasons for that. But on this December snowy evening, I stepped onto that stage in my pioneer skirt and my frilly blouse, my hair in a bun. I had one line, and I looked up, and I looked out, and I knew. I knew that they all knew that I didn't know my line and didn't know what I was doing up there. And, and I really thought hard, how can I make my escape? And then I froze. And then I wet myself. And then I ran headlong through the curtain stage right. And I vowed, I will never do that again. Uh, but some vows that are hastily made are meant to be broken. <laughs> This year marks my jubilee year in theater. It's been 50 years of trotting these boards, 50 years of witnessing life's truths on stage, off stage, and backstage. But all I want to tell you about another story. This little girl was 11. This little girl grew up in a very tumultuous time in our country, 1968. Mm. Protest music, protest art, protest theater was everywhere. It was a very, very difficult time for us. Adults had a hard time keeping up, let alone children. Feels very much like that today in 2018. But let's go back to 1968. This little girl lived in a community where she was bused away from her area in town to another school. For the first time in her life, her world was much bigger and she felt much smaller. It didn't help that she wore big black orthopedic shoes that clomped when she walked down the high hallway or that she was in pain from juvenile arthritis and that she wore big pink bifocals. No one sat with her at lunch. She felt very invisible, but she loved to read and write. She wanted to be an archeologist or an anthropologist. She wanted to know why people were the way they were. But at her new school, she knew that her teacher did not like her. The teacher questioned her all the time about her writings. Did you write that? Do you even know what you're talking about? Use that word in a sentence right now. The little girl didn't know what to do, what to say. The teacher made her so nervous, she stammered, and she could never explain that she understood what she was writing. One day, the teacher said to her, come out of the classroom. And the little girl followed the teacher down the hallway while everybody in the classroom was looking at her. The teacher didn't say a word. She stopped 
at a locked classroom and she unlocked the door. She motioned for the little girl to go inside. Inside the room were two refrigerator boxes and two desks and two chairs. And the teacher handed her a pencil and she handed her some paper. She said to the little girl, I want you to write a play. And when you do, I want you to show it to me. Well, the little girl's face changed in an instant. She didn't know what to think, but every day at 2 p.m., that mean teacher let that little girl out of the classroom to go write her play. One day, the little girl came to the teacher. She said, ma'am, my play is finished. It's called Runaway Fever. Runaway Fever was about a little girl who thought a good old-fashioned runaway was just the answer to all her troubles. The teacher read the script, and she approved because it had a happy ending. Well, casting began. Rehearsal started at 2 p.m. every day. Don't be late, the little girl said to her team. The set was made out of those refrigerator boxes, and the day came, and the fifth, the sixth grade all came to see the show. They sat on the gymnasium floor. They looked up on the stage. Act after act of runaway fever went through. Suddenly, it was time for the curtain call. The little girl stepped forward. She looked up. She looked out. And everybody was clapping. And they were standing on their feet. And that was the day that the little girl named Sad Sack knew she had broken her vow to ever be on stage again. Well, I met mean teacher after mean teacher who inspired me to tell my truth on stage. But eventually I grew up. I joined the Army. But while I was in the Army, while I was on duty, I wrote plays. I wrote them as an Army wife. I wrote them in my soccer mom van. I still haven't stopped writing. And along the way, beautiful elements and wonderful people came into my life to help me create theater companies across the United States. But none of those theater companies was as dear to me as a theater company called Heart, Hillsborough Actors Repertory Theater. That was where my children and a community of families worked hard to make beautiful stories come to life full of inspiration and education. None of my children performed more than my only daughter, Diana Brookins. She loved the stage, and the audience loved her. Mark Dundas Woods, a film and theater critic for the Portland Oregonian, wrote of my daughter at 14, Diana Brookins is a young Bette Midler, full of energy and wry humor. At 25, my daughter passed away and left the earth, and I left with her. I decided to make another vow, and I told the creator who had created in me that I would never do theater again as long as I did not have my daughter to do it with me. I became very cynical about all thoughts of stage life. I began to think that theater wasn't really art at all, or perhaps just the lowest form of art. Within a year, my family moved to a small town in central Florida. One morning, I woke up feeling very small and very useless in my new small town. And I went to the school where I had enrolled my youngest son, small faith-based school. I went to the principal and I said, I'd, uh, <laughs> I'd like to volunteer in your theater department. I <laughs> but I was thinking along the lines of hanging up costumes. But I will never forget her words to me. We don't have a theater department. We've been praying for one for 20 years. <laughs> you know what? I thought so hard that I was sure she could hear me. 
20 years, you had children come through this school who didn't know that they had shine in them and something useful to give the world. I left her presence, I went home, and I thought long and long and hard about it. And I want you to know, 10 years have passed and that little school has produced more than 30 productions. Some of the students have gone on to professional careers. In 2014, two of my students, two young women who are now college-bound, who had been performing with me since they were 9 and 11, came to me and they said, Miss Kim, we want to help you write a story about your daughter's life and produce it. And every day that summer on their college break, those young women helped me write the story about my daughter's life and bring her life to life again on stage. Many people were helped by her story. And that is the full circle of truth-telling from the stage. Well, it's been many years, as I've said, of seeing life played out backstage, on stage, and off stage. And while I am perhaps making a decision to leave that behind and pass my baton on to another generation, it occurs to me that in just this moment in time, all of you and I have had a relationship. We have had an encounter. We have come to understand one another a little better. Creative artists do not exist without you, and we need you. I am asking you today as you leave this theater, this wonderful state of the art theater, and by the way, in order to make sure that theater continues, I want to emphasize this. We do not need big theaters. We do not need big budgets. We do not need Broadway professionals, but we need unlocked doors. We need open hearts. We need open minds. We need vision and energy to make it happen. This is so important for those that need to shine and for those who need to see the shine. You know, I stand here before you, a disappearing breed, the high school drama teacher, but it doesn't have to be that way. And you know, a gymnasium stage is just as capable a vehicle as taking an audience to Neverland as the biggest theater on Broadway. Theater is right here. It's right now. It's pop-up theater. It's street theater. It's the high school musical. It's the poetry slam downtown in a place that only seats 20. It's TEDx. That's theater, people. And we need to connect human being to human being more than we ever have before. I was once an 11-year-old girl sitting in the dark until I strode out onto a lit stage and found out that I had some shine in me and a useful gift. My challenge to you today is to remember all of us that need theater, that we've had this in our world for millennials, millennials time, we need to keep it going. Theater is both scripted and spontaneous. And I want to share with you right now, I had heavily considered in this jubilee year of my life to really let it go and give it to somebody else. But here's the spontaneous part right now. I've had an epiphany with you. <laughs> I deeply feel it in my bones in a way that perhaps you can feel, but you couldn't see on videotape. <laughs> there is another story to tell, a true story that needs to be heard. Ooh, my fingers are itchy. I feel like writing. So while I make my timely exit, I leave you with this mission. 
take these words, take these little stories from a children's point of view, and do what you can. Unlock a door, buy a season theater ticket, encourage a child to take acting classes, encourage a senior to get on stage, because Shakespeare got it slightly wrong. We are not merely players. We are 11-year-old producers. We are 35-year-old playwrights. We are 60-year-old producers. We are 80-year-old performers. And we are truth-telling activists from the stage. Today, today I have hope that by the time we reach the year 3000, Theaters will be everywhere. <laughs>